Welcome everyone. I'm Charlotte von Robert, the director of the Taubi Center for uh, Jewish Studies. And um, I'm very excited to welcome our two uh, speakers, presenters today, two very extremely wonderful uh, women. Uh, before I introduce them, just a quick thank you to my helpers in the back, Linda Huin, the office manager, and Nicole Bridges, um, Nicole Bridges, <laughs> who's with us for one more week before, um, before focusing on other things, um, uh, more important things. Um, but we have a very busy month, so without their help, um, none of this would, would uh, happen. Um, so let me introduce uh, the annual Charles Michael Lecture. Um, as you know, or as some of you know, the, uh, the structure of this is that we actually have two parts to this. So um, Amy Reichert and Susie Collower already spoke yesterday, last night, at the JCC in San Francisco because the uh, Charles Michael Lecture is a collaboration with the JCC in San Francisco. Um, and so they had a lot of people last night in, uh, in San Francisco. We are also happy, of course, to welcome them down south here in uh, the peninsula to, San uh, to Stanford. Um, and it's an, uh, this year a slightly different f uh, format, which I'm very excited about to have two people uh, in conversation with each other. So let me briefly introduce both of them, even though many of you already know um, or not know them in one way or another. Um, Amy, uh, Amy Reichert, I'm tempted, I told her, to pronounce in the German way, Amy Reichert, uh, is an award-winning architect, exhibition designer, and designer of Judaica. And since 1996, and many of us know her work because it's exhibited in, uh, in many public spaces, uh, places. Uh, so since 1996, when she won second place in the Philip and Sylvia Spurtis Judaica Prize for her Seder plate, she has participated in invited jury exhibitions and museums around the world. Her work can be seen not just here in San Francisco, on the West Coast in the Contemporary Jewish uh, Museum, but of course in the Jewish Museum in New York, in Vienna, also at the Yale University Art Gallery and other places. So recent and recent large-scale commissions, and both of them will talk about the work also, recent large-scale commissions include work for Or Shalom Synagogue in San Diego uh, and the renovation of the Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City. Um, Susie Colliver is known to many of you because she is a local person, uh, a native San Franciscan. There are not many of those in, 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 in this day and age. I know very few people that are native from California. Um, uh, and she's a graduate of, graduate of the architecture program uh, of in Ber at UC Berkeley and um, has uh, most importantly for today's program, um, you, uh, you mentioned this, a former camp counselor at a vibrant Jewish summer camp. I love the fact that you introduced it the way. Uh, formerly in Santa Cruz. What is the camp? It was called Saratoga, then it was called SWIG, and now it's defunct. Oh, SWIG. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. SWIG, uh, where she met Helen Burke, and um, that served as an experience that influences her prof professional work till today. Uh, she's active in many nonprofit organizations in J Street and also um, Bent the Ark. Um, and she's been the president of the much beloved San Francisco f uh, Film Festival for many years. Um, but for our purpose today, also, Susie, along with her two partners, Bob Herman and Steve Reagan, uh, um, runs the San Francisco Herman Colliver um, Architecture Office. The office is unusual in that they design um, projects mostly for nonprofit, only for nonprofit organizations. Um, 
in, uh, in mostly in two different contexts for low and very low income housing uh, um, projects and then on the other hand for um, Jewish communal spaces and um, some of you I have never managed yet to make it up to um, the congregation cultural fire in Tiburon which uh, she designed but there are many other local spaces uh, in Californian uh, synagogues where um, Susie had her designing hand. Congregation B'nai Israel Sanctuary in San Clemente, in the Temple Judea in Tarzana, uh, the Peninsula Temple Sholem in Burlingame, Temple Akiva in Calva City, and many more. Also the Hillel, that I didn't know, Hillel House in Berkeley. Berkeley. Hillel and Leah House Judaica at the Reutlinger Center to uh, have the full title. I want yeah. us to get <laughs> to today's program, so I'm really, really grateful that both of you came out and are bearing with us to also come down to Central. So please help me welcome uh, Amy and Susan. Thank you so much, Charlotte. It's um, a real treat and a delight to have been asked to speak on this subject. Um, Amy and I had not met previous to two days ago, but we've been, we've been collaborating via email and telephone for um, many weeks now um, and have found, much to our surprise and delight, that we are soul sisters. We, we seem to approach um, the sacred in, in a very similar way and, and having um, sparred a little bit in the preparing of this talk has been a wonderful exercise for us both. So we thank you to the Taube Center for Jewish Studies, to Stanford University, to Charles Michael uh, for setting up the lectureship. Um, it's, it's been just a great pleasure. Let's see. Oh, it works. Um, today, in talking over the many, many weeks, uh, we've found that there are certain common themes in our work. And uh, rather than a dialogue um, between ourselves right now, um, we'll have a dialogue on the screen and um, happily answer your questions thereafter. Um, our work, it, the, com the common points of our work, uh, fall into sort of three major categories. Uh, unfolding rituals, cyclical time, which is the nature of the Jewish time and calendar, and uh, the stories that are embodied in, in the work that we do. So I'll jump right into unfolding rituals. Um, we found oftentimes when we start working with a new client group, and, and we're always working with committees, because working with congregations is a committee uh, structure by nature, and we ask, please think of spaces where you have sensed that you were able to access the sacred, whatever that means to you. And very frequently we hear people say, it was in a redwood grove, it was at the beach at sunset, it was in the desert at midnight, it was on you know, the top of a, of a mountain peak where I could see nothing but clouds. Um, rarely does someone say, I stepped into a space and all of a sudden I was able to access a part of myself that didn't formally exist. It, we've rarely heard that. So we'll start with where it all begins. And, and for me, it began in the Santa Cruz Mountains at the Jewish summer camp, um, looking up at the redwood trees. Um, in historic times, uh, people recognized much the same impulse. and. Um, the, the sort of height of that recognition was were the Gothic cathedrals, which in fact have a lot of resonance with uh, a redwood grove or pieces of nature or dappled light coming through leaves or something that raises one's um, uh, sense of, of, of the moment. But today, our lives are no, not so steeped in tradition and so steeped in religion that oftentimes stepping into these we can appreciate how beautiful they are structurally and, and how magnificent the artwork is. But many of us find that we are not elevated in our spirit necessarily 
by walking into um, the kinds of sacred spaces that have often worked in the past. Um, all the more so for some of our um, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestors um, who in the uh, 19th and 20th century, for instance in Upper West Side New York where this is, um, were s the, the, their lives, their, their spiritual lives, religious lives, and their daily lives were so intertwined. There was no separation. They didn't need to cross a threshold to access the divine. They could literally walk into a, a, a rather seemingly unspecial door into a room that we might find lacking in, in spiritual qualities with the fluorescent lights and the plastic on the, on the Torah table and like, and nonetheless they were so close to their religion that they were able to transform themselves or, or maybe they were already there, they didn't need to trans be transported. But today um, we're finding that few of us have access to our spiritual lives at, at the ready in that way. Um, sometimes we get it um, through artwork. This is a very spectacular piece that was recently at the Broad Museum, the new Broad in, in Los Angeles, where you walk into a space that is startling. And for a moment, you are transported somewhere. But what differentiates this kind of experience from a sacred space is that it doesn't take you to a particular place. It takes, you, it takes your breath away, but then it leaves you with no particular content. So what we find in our work is that we're being asked to develop spaces that act as props to assist people who <coughs> have very busy lives, uh, secular lives, access parts of themselves that they can't otherwise get to. Um, a very important um, uh, experience for Bob Herman, my partner and husband who is here, um, was a trip that we took to uh, Fushimi Inari in Japan. And I'm going to go quickly through these sets of slides. What we realized is that for us, and, and we sense for many of those with whom we encounter, um, it takes a, a, a decompression um, period to get rid of the noise that's in our heads and be able to um, prepare ourselves to potentially be able, maybe, to have an experience beyond the everyday. Uh, Fushimi Nari is, is, a, is a shrine. There's a long procession to get there, and I'll just quickly run through the slides, and I think you'll understand. So to get to the shrine, you walk through thousands of these Tori gates. And most importantly, as you're going, you never do see your destination. It's, there's a mystery and a surprise that pulls you through. And sometimes you're given a choice of paths. You're, there's not a singular correct way. And you have opportunities to look back on where you've come just as you can look ahead to where you're going without knowing where you're going. And it's a total immersion in uh, something that is made by man um, and yet has the power to create a long threshold. Um, when we were uh, working on the design for Kol Shofar, which is a synagogue that I know some of you here have visited in Tiburon, um, we recognized that because of the site, we had an opportunity to stretch the threshold, um, not like Fushimi Inari, but in a way that might help people, assist people in leaving their cars behind and getting to the sanctuary and getting to a place in themselves where they presumably are trying to go because they're going to a sacred space. Um, and I'll take you through that very quickly. Uh, at Kol Shofar, you leave your car and you can see that there's a path ahead. It's, it's the only path, it's the only path in, in view. So you know without signs. You don't need a sign that says, enter here. There's a path and it takes you somewhere but you don't know where. And um, so you start the journey. And at the start of the journey, at the first step, you can already see the first landing. So you know it's attainable. You know, you know you can get there. Unlike the ancient pyramids, which were built to 
um, suggest that the, the journey was very difficult and almost nobody could get there. And you knew where you were getting to at the point when you set out on the journey, but it was hard, hard, hard. The impetus, impetus here is to make it seem very accessible. Anybody can do this. I can get there and I can go on. Uh, along the way, there are a series of benches so that if you're struggling to get there, there's a place to come to rest. And then you continue on and you still don't know where you're going. And then you get to the top and you have a clue. There's, a, there's a, the first sign of, of your destination, or potentially the first sign of your destination. And then you get the full view, and you see that the um, canopy that greets you um, is made out of 12 um, beams, and if you're astute, you might think 12. Now, where have I heard that number before? And recognize that as a signifier of the 12 uh, tribes of Jacob, um, of whom 10 were brothers and two were half-brothers, and so the two on the outsides are separated from the middle ones. And you see that there is a light drawing you forward, although there are choices. There's, it's never just one way. And as you get closer to the um, entry, the formal entry, um, there are some um, constructions that are sized, people-sized. So you're already clued in to the fact that people are welcome here. and and. Um, and it's meant to be animated, even when there aren't people on site. And you'll notice the mezuzah on the right as you're entering. And um, in this case, we had the opportunity to design not just the spaces, but also the Judaica. So we designed the mezuzah um, to reflect the shape of the sanctuary inside, which you'll see in, in a few minutes. And once you step inside the bounds, um, you still don't know your destination. You still have multiple paths. But you come to understand that these hemlock slats signify something. And it, one intuits that that is the special space. It's not the sheetrock wall. It's the space that's quite distinctly different. And you um, find yourself to one of several doors. There are always several ways in. There's never just one correct way. Um, and you head towards it. And as you approach it, you pass uh, familiar um, accoutrements. In this case, it's, it's drawers to hold the little uh, kipot that often end up sitting on folding tables outside the doors because one didn't think about it ahead of time. Um, but it's very intentional and it's set up in order to suggest a change from the everyday. It is, it's, it's, it's getting you ready. So you walk through that door and you still don't see your destination. You're still on a path. Um, the path is still a winding path. You, get, you pick up your prayer book, you might pick up your prayer shawl, and you wonder, what's around the bend? And you find that the bend is, is um, uh, sheathed in, in materials that do not suggest your home or your, or your school or your workplace. You're, you're being taken somewhere else. And finally, you get to the destination, which is the sanctuary. You see where you've come from. You get a taste of where you're going. And then the entire sanctuary unfolds um, in front of you. And the sanctuary is um, as um, rather elliptical as, as the path to get there. Um, there, is, uh, there. There is no defined hierarchy of space in the space. It is not symmetrical, as one might expect um, a, a, an authoritarian space to be. Um, the highest point in the room is not the most important, is not over the most important uh, uses in the room. What, what uh, centers the room is actually the circle of lights in the middle, which defines the, um, the area where the Torah table is uh, and, and focuses one's energy. You'll note here that there are seven skylights total. There's six that are identical, um, suggesting the, the six days of creation um, leading up to the Sabbath. And then the, the seventh um, skylight is the um, round one, out of which the eternal light, the Ner Tamid, is, um, <coughs> is hung. Uh, the Torah table is established in such a way that, uh, designed such a way that 
you can read from either facing east towards the ark or facing west towards the congregation. Um, and again, you can see the, um, the eternal light hanging there. And there's, there's a story about eternal light, but I think I'm not going to tell it now. If anybody's interested afterwards, I can talk about that later on. Um, you, as you get closer and closer to the most sacred point of the space, which is the ark itself, um, there's an intensity that builds as you come towards the fore without being um, fancy. It's not, you're not, it, you're not, it's not suggested by gold, it's not suggested by um, ornamentation, but rather by the intensity of the light. Um, the eternal light um, ha has some wonderful stories, I'm happy to tell them later on. This is a piece of it, the, the shards of the light actually have uh, prayers engraved in them, in them which uh, twist and sparkle in the course of the day, and the mechanical system, the heating and uh, electrical system makes it move in the air so that sparks fly around the room. Uh, you closer yet to the ark, the ark itself, which has a whole other set of stories it, it, uh, that were suggested to us by the rabbi of the synagogue who um, talked to us about a, a, a mystical um, story of a young maiden who unfolds her, who, who exposes herself slowly over time to solely those who love her as an analogy to the Torah itself, opening itself, becoming evident only to those who seek it and love it. So this, that story defined the definition of the Ark itself, where you do and don't see the Torah. And finally, the ultimate destination, of, of any Jewish sacred space, which is the Torah itself. Uh, very, very quickly, another such example of a path to the sacred space being as important as the space itself. It's it, it, how you ready yourself. This is a synagogue we did in uh, Los Angeles, Temple of uh, Judea. And here, this, the sanctuary was actually on the second floor. and. Um, in order to get people to be willing to walk up the 18-foot elevation gain, uh, we devised a notion of, of a mosaic stairway that tells the story of creation along the way, hopefully um, uh, enlivening that climb so that it becomes less painful. In all these spaces, of course, there are accessible ways into these uh, spaces as well and the entry to the sanctuary. So with that, um, a, a, a taste, I'd like to turn it over to Amy to talk about how her work um, fits in. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks again to everybody here who helped make this possible. Um, I'm gonna turn now to talking about objects that sort of dovetail with the kinds of issues that, that Susie has described in her practices work. Uh, but first I'd like to start with a non-Jewish object, which I think is one of the most nearly perfect objects uh, ever designed. It's a modern Japanese sake cup. And what I love about this simple object is its power to communicate to us, even if we don't know exactly what's going on, and even if it doesn't have a specifically uh, ritual overlay or use. Uh, so the sake cup is made of hinoki cypress, a traditional Japanese material in building and objects. Uh, it wraps itself in a single piece, inviting your hand to embrace it in the same way. The material of hinoki cypress is somewhat pliant, so it responds to the touch of your hand and the touch of your lips as you drink from it. Uh, the outside is lacquered in order to resist staining, but the inside uh, is left unlacquered so that when you bring the cup to your lips, uh, the liquid releases the inherent fragrance in the hinoki wood, and so you're left with this completely sensual experience of smell and taste uh, at the same time. Uh, this kind of material also is a really good insulator, kind of like today's extra jacket on a coffee cup, uh, so that it maintains the temperature whether you're drinking warm or cold sake from it. So even without any kind of symbolic overlay, you know, it invites us to embrace it, it interacts in a very gentle way with our body, and for me represents a model of how much material and form can kind of communicate to us even if we don't understand what an object is, is all about. 
Um, so I'd like to share with you one of my uh, Kiddush cup designs. And as many of you know, uh, the act of making Kiddush or Kiddush is an act of separation. It's that ritual act that marks the leaving of the profane days of the week behind and entering into the sacred time uh, of Shabbat every Friday night. Uh, so because it's about separation, I wanted the very act of using the Kiddush cup to have embodied in it uh, the same act of separation. Uh, this was a commission by parents of twin boys for their bar mitzvah. So I was very interested in exploring the ideas of twinning, which of course occurs several times uh, in the Torah, the idea of using a material from Israel, this is olive wood, um, and also the idea embodied in their Torah portion of Bashalach that was read on their bar mitzvah, which the climactic moment is the parting of the Red Sea and the passage of uh, the Israelites through the dry bed uh, left in between. So these two cups separate like twins. They have the same DNA. They're the same complex geometric form. But also like twins, they play out in different ways. So it's the same form rotated, just the way twins is, have the twins' personalities uh, kind of develop in very different ways. Uh, when you part the cups, enacting the splitting of the Red Sea, uh, walls of hammered silver echo those walls of water, uh, creating what many commentators have called the birth canal of the Jewish people, which also seemed appropriate for uh, the birthdays of the boys. Uh, to make Kiddush, you actually lift and separate uh, the Kiddush cups made of hammered silver from their weekly housing, kind of embedded in this uh, wooded landscape uh, of the cups themselves. Um, so it's, it's my hope that when these boys go off on their own, you know, they'll come together in some Shakespearean moment when the signet rings fit together and they'll realize their long lost uh, brotherhood. Uh, another moment of separation or marking the difference in time, uh, in Jewish time over the course of the week, are the lighting of Shabbat candles. So here's another opportunity for an object to kind of change its form or state uh, to help us articulate that change in time. Uh, these Shabbat candlesticks during the week are like pregnant buds, sort of awaiting their moment uh, to bloom on Friday night when the six petals representing the six days of the week open up and allow you to put Shabbat candles in uh, as the sort of centerpiece uh, of this marking of time. So we're going to talk about time a little bit more. Uh, Jewish time is famously cyclical rather than linear. We're constantly uh, kind of blending past, present, and future in the holidays we enact, uh, maybe most significantly coming up with Passover when we ourselves are supposed to see that we came out of Egypt, thereby completely uh, distorting this idea of linear time. It's supposed to be a kind of recurring uh, present to us, and that's something that's been very uh, important in our work. So Susie's going to take it from there. Thank you. Um, I think most interestingly, we've been intrigued with the notion that Jewish time is not linear time. It, the way our, our weekday time tends to be what we're doing the next day, the next week, the next month. Uh, Jewish time uh, goes around in circles, uh, and those circles are informed by the weekly Torah portions. Uh, that has all sorts of ramifications for design, interestingly. Um, as we know, or may know, that a new day starts at sunset when one can see three stars. And that starts telling us that um, every day there's this new cycle. We used the notion of time and how time is marked by daylight um, as we uh, considered a new chapel for the same synagogue in Los Angeles that we had shown you a few minutes ago. Um, traditionally in Judaism, the most sacred space, the Torah, is surrounded by a, a curtain, a parochet curtain. Um, and we saw the, um, we made an analogy between a curtain, a parochet curtain covering the Holy of Holies and a, um, a wrapping of the sacred space itself as though it was being enshrouded, enshrined by a, a fabric. And uh, the, we used the um, dancing letters, uh, the Hebrew letters, which actually spell nothing in particular and therefore can be seen as spelling everything. Every word is embodied in these, in these letters somehow um, as, as, uh, as a vehicle to mark the passage of time. 
because the shadows that they throw are different at every moment of every hour of every day. Um, we wrapped the outdoor sanctuary with the same um, motif, and in this case you don't even see where the patterning is coming from. You're simply aware of how the, the um, shadows change as the sun passes in the sky. Inside the chapel, um, one gets the um, strength from being completely surrounded by these very animated uh, letter forms. Um, and they, because of the light that they throw against the walls and around at different places in the space at different times, you're constantly aware of the passage of time and, and how that plays in to syncopating um, Jewish life. How about that? <laughs> Great. So, as Susie described, sort of the cycle of the day and sunlight as it pass over, as passes over a building, of course the annual cycle of holidays also presents an opportunity to, to play with time, especially buildings that occur within time in the sense that they are erected and dissolve kind of on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, of course, the um, sukkah gives us uh, an opportunity every year to sort of construct for ourselves this hut that we're supposed to live in or at least dine in, uh, and it gives an idea of building as a very temporary kind of fragile expression of our existence on Earth. Um, most sukkahs are designed with a kind of post and beam system, meaning it's a kind of frame with a paneled wall, maybe fabric or, or wood panels. Um, but I was interested in exploring this idea of a fragile building through the metaphor of a house of cards. Uh, after all, that sort of means uh, this very tenuous existence where a strong wind can blow something over and that's supposed, supposed to be the kind of fragility that we feel when we're living in this sukkah state uh, one week out of the year. Um, so the, the sukkah is made of wood interlocking panels um, and these are perforated with the shape of the four species associated with the holiday, uh, the etrog or citron uh, over here, the uh, myrtle leaves, uh, Hmm. This one, I guess. <laughs> the palm leaf and then the willow as well. So just looking at the mo decorative motifs remind you of these other uh, symbolic associations um, with the holiday. Uh, when you look, when you sit in the sukkah, you have slight views out, especially at the corner. We always think of corners uh, as really the, the place where a building is supported. But here, because there are no structural corners and you simply get a band of light turning the corner, it uh, again sort of emphasizes that idea of, of fragility and exposure to the elements and to the um, potential for things to be destroyed uh, in a moment. This is a picture of the sukkah going up. So it's uh, simply about 18 by 30 inch panels that then interlock. And again, like the desert sukkah, is not structurally stable until the last beams uh, are put in place, which you see in the lower, lower right-hand corner. Here it is from the outside. It's a, a holiday that has strong uh, kind of resonances of hospitality and universality, so it glows like a lantern at night, sort of inviting passers-by to come participate in the, the festive meal that takes place uh, inside. Um, something that Susie and I deal with uh, in our work and is a very important Jewish value is called Hidor Mitzvah. Um, but most times Hidor Mitzvah is translated as beautifying the mitzvah. So it's this acknowledgement that beauty and decoration add something to uh, a mitzvah or a ritual commandment. Um, but I was never very happy with this definition because it sounds like you have an object and then in order to uh, to enact Hidor Mitzvah, you sort of decorate it, you embellish it, you sort of gussy it up. Um, but the ancient Roman uh, convert to Judaism, uh, nephew of the Emperor Hadrian Onkelos, who's the translator of the Torah into Aramaic, had a beautiful definition. He said it's not so much beautifying the mitzvah as inhabiting the mitzvah. And I think 
Um, that's very much an approach that, that probably appeals to Susie as well as myself, this idea that we can excavate Jewish texts and ideas to sort of inform a deeper understanding of the ritual act. So rather than decoration that's added to something, the very form itself can speak to us and uh, deepen our ritual uh, enjoyment and act. Um, so this is an outdoor ark made for a camp in Wisconsin, a Jewish camp. Uh, and most outdoor arks are sort of waterproofed indoor arks. Uh, they don't really acknowledge their existence outside. So I thought it would be fun to play with the ark uh, as an object that could respond to the sun, the wind, and the rain, those natural elements that uh, are constantly uh, present um, in its environment. Um, so the, the form of the roof echoes, it's an abstraction of the wings of the Keruvim, the angels that hovered over uh, the original ark in the desert tabernacle, the Mishkan. Uh, the doors uh, are set with uh, loosely attached uh, metal panels, 12 times 12, echoing the sort of abundance of the 12 tribes that are often a motif on traditional ark doors. Um, and their shimmering uh, surface reflects the setting sun, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but first, the roof, as well as acting like the, uh, the wings of the Keruvim, the angels, uh, also form a water spout and sort of articulate that act of, of rain that happens so often at camp. Here we see an example by uh, Barragan, a famous and wonderful Mexican architect, of making an event, an exciting dramatic event, out of the shooting of water. And that's what happens here when it rains at camp. So as well as the roof kind of interacting with rain, uh, the panels of the doors reflect the setting sun since the orientation of the chapel is east, the doors face west. And so Kabbalat Shabbat, the Friday night service, uh, is really charted in the increasing shadows uh, of uh, reflections on these doors. The inside of the ark, when open on Saturday morning, has sunlight streaming through the back. It's a translucent panel set with uh, prairie grass uh, and kind of embraces the Torah, creating different shadows uh, on Saturday morning. Um, one of the values of the camp is that Judaism and nature are intertwined, and so the translucency of the back of the ark reminds campers that pass by of this integration of religion and nature. Uh, the handles invite the touch and develop a patina over time from use as well as exposure to the elements. Uh, and the cladding is simple cedar boards that echo the construction of the bunks uh, of the surrounding camps. So we'd like to talk about embodied stories, our last section, and Susie's going to start that. In approaching our work, we frequently look to texts, the religious texts, for um, clues as to how we might proceed. Um, beyond that, though, we look to our shared cultural um, stories, uh, stories handed down from our families, stories that we've been told um, over time, as well as our personal memories of times that have been meaningful to us uh, in, in, in the course of our lives. Um, I'll tell this one quick little story which it was, uh, it came to us when we were thinking about the very first ark, uh, ark of the Torah that we ever designed. I recall that as a small child, um, when I was in the synagogue and the Torah was being marched around the room as it is twice in every Shabbat service, um, at, before the Torah reading and after the Torah reading, um, I always knew where the um, Torah scroll was along the march by being able to hear the sound of the tinkling bells, because there are often, almost always, bells on the Torah crowns. I, could, I didn't know where it was because I was beyond the shoulder height of the, the grown-ups around me, but I could, I, by hearing the bells, you could trace the course of that procession, which I loved. Um, so we thought about that idea in the design of the Torah. This is uh, Peninsula Temple Beth El, not far from here in San Mateo which we redesigned. It had been designed in the 60s and we uh, warmed it up in many ways. Uh, the ark is here in the center and there in the detail. It was designed to look intentionally like the Mishkan in the desert that was of a size and nature that four strong people could hoist it on their shoulders and carry it through the desert for 40 years. Um, looking at a close-up of it, you'll see the inclusion of the bells in the door, such that 
um, the, it recalled the memory of when those doors open, every time the doors are opened, you hear the tinkling of the bells. Um, and every time the doors are closed, you again hear the tinkling. And so it suggests both the coming of the reading of the Torah, which is a moment of great anticipation, as well as the conclusion and the return to um, normalcy uh, when the Torahs are put away. Um, in addition, the um, doors of the, of the Ark are made of these uh, squares of dichroic glass, which throw shards of light around the room as the doors open. So you, as you pull the doors open, you hear the tinkle, you see the sparkle, and again at the end, um, which uh, seems to captivate particularly small children, or small people, little, who oftentimes don't <laughs> under, understand quite what's going on, but they like the sparkle and they like the sounds. Another quick story um, is the story of two rivers. We did a sanctuary in Sacramento for B'nai Israel, which was a synagogue that had been firebombed um, in the late 90s, and the congregation wanted to open it up, make it as transparent as possible, um, indicate to the community and reinforce to themselves that they weren't afraid, they were um, continuing with in, from strength to strength. Um, so we developed a very translucent, transparent quality to this um, sanctuary, um, in part suggested by the chuppah overhead, which is in place all the time, suggesting both family and celebration, um, as well as in the design of the ark itself, which is made of frosted glass and fabric and um, meant to, to blend in certain moments with the outside um, clouds passing by. So in its closed form and in its open form, and it actually tells the story of um, the synagogue's relationship to the Sacramento River. This is in plan. The synagogue, this is the Sacramento River flowing into the San Francisco River Delta. Um, it's also seen as the Jordan River. Both rivers um, support their local um, populations by being very fertile. Um, the um, hatch marks here suggesting the rows of crops in the Sacramento Valley, the um, run-on um, portion, Torah portions, the parshiot of the Torah, forming a similar kind of row, um, agrarian row on the right-hand side, and then the delta flowing into the Mediterranean, and Israel um, here in the map. And then as you see it from close up, um, and again, the, the Torah is uh, shrouded a bit. You can see part of it. You can't see all of it. It's meant to be something of an alluring tease. You want to learn more. You want to see more. Okay. So this is the story of a very recent commission for a synagogue in San Diego, Congregation Or Shalom, um, who had recently refurbished their sanctuary, uh, but were looking for art pieces to flank uh, the bima, the central stage um, that you see here. Uh, and the prompt for the commission was to design two pieces of artwork uh, that would be related to each other but not exactly the same uh, and also that would not incorporate the sort of typical synagogue symbols you might expect like Ten Commandments or menorahs, that kind of thing. So that was how they, they left it. And um, my inspiration for generating the design um, is this very beautiful idea that, that also um, Susie alluded to in her project uh, of this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire that led the Israelite people uh, through the desert and, uh, and into the promised land. Um, so the pillar of cloud by day is a sort of daytime beacon. The pillar of fire by night uh, is like the head of a caravan sort of carrying this pyre uh, forward to, to lead people. Um, one intriguing aspect of this pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, to me, was that it was a very public revelation. Uh, the Torah mentions it at least three times. Uh, first, just prior to the passage through the Red Sea. Uh, next, on Mount Sinai, there was uh, what one commentator has called a chaos of the elements, when people could s see the thunder and hear the fire. 
Uh, and then third, when the Mishkan, the Desert Tabernacle, is completed uh, to, to God's satisfaction, uh, God's presence sort of descends in the form of a cloud. So unlike earlier revelations uh, to, to prophets and patriarchs, which were a kind of divine whisper in the ear, this is a very democratic, uh, public uh, declaration of a relationship between the people and the divine. So it seemed particularly appropriate to me as the symbols uh, of the, the uh, front walls of a contemporary conservative congregation. Um, I think any piece of public art needs to be tightly knit into its surroundings. So for the design that sort of generated uh, the final project, uh, I looked into some of the patterns of the Moorish designs that were present in the existing uh, synagogue. It's a synagogue from the early uh, 1920s, and synagogues of the era very frequently incorporated uh, Islamic pattern into their various uh, motifs throughout uh, doorways, panels, etc. So this was uh, a wonderful pattern um, that was noted by uh, a French archaeologist in the late 19th century. And one of the reasons I found it appealing was it had a very subtle uh, indication in the negative space between the panels uh, of a Jewish star. So it didn't sort of shout it out, but if you were kind of distracted in synagogue and mesmerized somewhat by the artwork in the front, which is always a good goal of synagogue art is to sort of occupy the masses while they're <laughs> a bit distracted, uh, you might see this sort of form of the Jewish star uh, kind of coming and going. Uh, another uh, relationship to the existing architecture was the uh, synagogue's beautiful historic uh, stained glass windows. Um, so the colors for the cloud of silver and uh, silver and gray and blue on the left and the pillar of fire, gold and oranges on the right, uh, really came out of and related to the scale of the pieces of glass uh, and the color palette of the historic stained glass, which was elsewhere in the sanctuary. Uh, the piece had some dimension so that it would cast changing shadows over the course of the day and also look different from different perspectives within the sanctuary. Uh, and finally, here it is kind of flanking and emphasizing uh, the importance of the bima, but kind of spilling off into the negative spaces uh, of the walls that framed uh, the central focus of the synagogue. So we're going to close with two uh, pieces for the upcoming holiday of Passover, which, of course, uh, is full of ritual objects. Um, and I want to explore again that idea of inhabiting the mitzvah and excavating traditional textual ideas for uh, generating new designs. So these are four different Seder plates currently available, the ones on the top, uh, sort of typical traditional ones. Um, but something that I found a bit of a challenge in these is that they rely on words for placing the various ritual foods. And Passover is supposed to be a holiday that really brings everybody together with this common uh, story. And it's really supposed to appeal also to young children who can't yet read. So the reliance on words for communicating the ideas on the Seder plate seemed to me to be somewhat uh, exclusive. Um, the two on the bottom don't really share that um, issue, but while they're, they can be very beautiful designs, they really don't speak in a specific way uh, to what this uh, object is supposed to achieve. Um, the Seder itself is a kind of domestic drama telling the story and retelling the story of the Exodus from Egypt. And the main stage prop that you have on your table to help you tell that story uh, is this plate. So I think there's uh, the burden of communication is very present there. Um, Many of you are familiar with the ritual foods that go on the Seder plate, each of which have multiple symbolic meanings, but these are kind of some of the major ones outlined here. Uh, the egg, the hazeret or lettuce, bitter herbs, parsley, shank bone, and haroset, which has no English translation, <laughs> paste, sweet paste of some sort. So in trying to come up with an idea of this, uh, for this Seder plate, which was done for the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, um, I sort of started staring at these foods thinking, you know, what, what can come of this? And I realized that the foods actually broke down into two categories, right? Three out of the six symbolize slavery, and the other three symbolize freedom. Um, yet, no Seder plate that I had seen really distinguished between these two very important states, which after all 
uh, tell the story uh, of the Exodus. Everything is treated with a kind of equivalence. So I thought it would be interesting to design a plate that actually helped tell the story by separating these two very different kinds of elements. So the slavery foods, the Hazaret, the Haroset, and the Moror are set into a heavy Jerusalem stone slab embedded with fossils, which imply a kind of imprisonment in time uh, and a very heavy um, kind of uh, excavation. The Haroset, you trowel into a brick shape uh, depression so that you're enacting the same act of the, the uh, Jewish slaves building the pyramids. Um, and in contrast with that, this thin floating disk represents the state of sort of gravityless uh, transport across the desert that the Israelites experienced in their freedom from slavery. So there, the parsley, which represents springtime green, is arranged as a little grove of trees. Uh, the egg has a spot, and the shank bone, which uh, symbolizes this elevated free will offering that the Jews were to make in the desert once they were liberated, uh, is raised up on its little kind of altar-like stand. But of course, separating and connecting these two states is the passage through the Red Sea. So while it's not traditionally mandated, a lot of people put salt water on their Seder plate. So here, the salt water takes the place of a channel between them. So it helps you tell the story from slavery across the Red Sea uh, to freedom. Uh, the last uh, object that I'll show, which relates to Passover as well, is kind of a new object. Um, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with this idea of a, a Miriam's cup, which is a new object that was really um, kind of invented and uh, born at feminist satyrs in the 1970s. Uh, it was felt that Miriam, sister of Moses, had a very pivotal role in the exodus from Egypt, yet wasn't recognized on the satyr table at all. Elijah, for instance, whose very tangential relationship to the whole story uh, is represented by a major cup of wine, yet Miriam, who was such an important character in the story, is not is sort of absent. So this was a desire to sort of create a new object uh, known as a Miriam's cup, which would help address this injustice. Um, and my usual mode of research and generating Jewish ideas from texts really failed because there are no you know, mentions of a Miri Miriam's cup uh, in the Talmud, the Seder plate itself is actually is mentioned in the Mishnah, so we have a very ancient body of literature that deals with the, what that object has to do, what it has to hold, what the material could be, how much of each thing you need on it, but there was no such thing for Miriam. So I thought to just dive into thinking about the three major symbolic associations that Miriam has uh, in the traditional literature. So first, this is an illustration from the medieval Golden Haggadah, shows Miriam, the musician with a tambourine, now famous from the Debbie Friedman song, uh, but she is known as the sort of mistress of music. She leads the women in the Song at the Sea, which celebrates uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. She's also known from a midrash or Jewish legend about a bottomless well of water uh, that nourished and followed the Israelites kind of mystically through the desert. Uh, and she's also known for the reeds at right, for sort of kicking the whole story into gear by rescuing Moses from his little riverbound basket and uh, through the reeds presenting Moses to Pharaoh's daughter to raise as her own, thereby kind of kicking off the whole story. So in this object, I hope to kind of meld and consolidate these three aspects of Miriam. Uh, it's a hemispherical hammered silver bowl, so it literally doesn't have a bottom, so it's a bottomless well. Um, when filled with water, it sort of reflects and sparkles um, to indicate that. Uh, it's also a uh, musical instrument because the timbrels that are loosely hung around the edge uh, and the hemisphere cause it to shimmy when the table is struck so that it becomes a tambourine and a musical instrument that everyone can play uh, at the table. Uh, the third association of the reeds is here, so we remember that she was instrumental in kind of rescuing Moses from that watery bed. Um, so I think this concludes our pre-question <laughs> part of our talk. Um, I think in both of our work, we try to engage the senses and engage a kind of modern sensibility to create objects that will speak to people today, 
yet resonate with uh, the, the broad and deep tradition that informs both of our work. And thank you again to everybody, Charlotta, Linda, Shelley, Charles Michael, and everybody who invited us. Thank you. We're happy to have sure. questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> George. Uh, you were talking about the entrance to the uh, to the unknown location. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. That's true for the first time you go to that. If you're, you know, that's your congregation, you go there every time. How does that play out? That's a really interesting question. Um, there, it's true that as in any space that one becomes accustomed to, um, we stop paying as close an attention as we did. And yet, by taking you through a, lands a natural landscape, California landscape, where we um, spent careful attention to keep the old oaks that were um, there um, intact, by curving the stair in such a way that it takes it out of the space of an ordinary stair and heightens the experience of ascending. Um, by virtue of the changing foliage throughout the course of the year, the grasses are green in the spring and then they turn yellow and then they turn brown. And because you're taken past a, a sensory, um, uh, along a sensory path, um, the, although it's the same path, it changes through the course of the seasons. And if you are of a mind to need to get rid of the noise, um, which many of us are and find a hard, ha really hard time stopping and, and slowing down, um, it serves at least to slow you down. Um, and then along the way, there's an olive tree, which is the ancient symbol of hope and peace. Um, there are other significant markers along the way, which, if you are of a mind to be intentional, um, can help to take you to a different place. So, sure. Sure. Uh, this is an extremely mundane question, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to know how, with your beautiful uh, stairways and ascending, um, how do you solve disability access? Yeah, it's, it's not a mundane question at all. And had we had more time, there is, I could have shown you, there is a, a secondary path along a slope. There's that lower parking lot where everybody parks. And then there's a higher parking lot, which is actually at the level of the upper courtyard, so that you can access the, um, the front courtyard and meet before entering the building all together, all in the same place, in as dignified a path, although not as long a path. Um, that's in the one. And the other one, um, there, there is an elevator, a, 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 a quite wonderful elevator in its own right, um, to take one from the first floor to the second floor. Uh, accessibility and access to everybody is, is of prime importance in these, in these facilities. Yeah, in Tiburon? Uh, I think it was completed in 2009 or 10. It was a renovation, it was a renovation in addition. We took the original down to stud. And if you remember what the old looked like, you won't see any resonance with the current. It, it was the old, get this, this is an educational institution. This, it was built, the building where Culture Far is now, was originally built as a middle school in the 70s, which isn't very long ago. It was built in the round, and it was completely underground. Every classroom was pie-shaped, and there was no natural light because they didn't want the children to be distracted. So you can imagine what a poor school it made. It closed three years later. And what a very unsatisfactory sanctuary it made. Um, so in, in our efforts, we not only redid the interior, we um, exposed what had been this lovely kippah-shaped dome, which there was not even any, it was all drop ceilings. It was all 12-foot ceilings um, with this drop. So we revealed the dome. Um, we cut in the skylights. We brought light into the lower spaces that we didn't show you. Um, and it had been, because it was a, it was a circle with pie-shaped classrooms in the middle with no natural light, the circulation was all around the outside, so you never knew where you were. You, it was every, there was no corners. You never knew where you were. You didn't know if you were 
coming towards the door or heading towards the bathroom. And so um, we, we literally just tore it all out um, and put it back in a way that made intuitive sense. I'm wondering if you ever find that it's a challenge um, to kind of reconcile the old and the new. So like to reconcile um, you know, tradition and heritage and things that are quite old and long uh, tradition to it with those modern ideas uh, of design and architecture that, um, that you were talking about. If you ever get pushback from people that are kind of... Uh, nah. No, no, never. Do what you back. want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a profession of pushback. <laughs> we have very strong forums. Um, so, speaking um, as someone who kind of comes into traditional spaces sometimes and tries to do uh, a modern intervention, um, it's it's a great question because I think sometimes those spaces that people may know from childhood or they have the seat they always sat in or even though the beam is falling apart it has to be exactly the way it was because that's the right way um, is a very delicate dance to sort of navigate that change change is hard and change in sacred spaces is, is even harder um, but I think if you approach it with the idea that you want to have a dialogue between the new and the old rather than just a sort of train rushing in um, that's very helpful uh, and it's also helpful once people see that the space that they think of as having always been the same is the product of an evolution and what they know is just one stage of that. Um, so I think the, the power of drawing on these traditional ideas is that just the way we have this amazing interpretation, literary history of literary interpretation from the rabbinic tradition of the, the Mishnah and Gemara to feminist and, you know, radical interpretations of today and that we can make those ancient ideas speak to us that translating that into a visual language is a challenge but there's always room for that as well. I think also as we suggested in the very beginning uh, we try and go back to basics. We, 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 we work really hard to stay away from issues of style um, and we try and get people to talk about their feelings and where what is it that they want this space to do what is not just functionally they obviously it needs to be heated and it needs to be well lit and you need to have sound system and some it has to be a place to put the garbage all of that aside what do you want it to do for you as a community and interestingly each congregation we've had the great good fortune to work with has had a different answer which is why they don't they don't start looking like cookie cutter designs each one is a reflection of the culture of, of that specific community. And as an example, Culture Far, which you were just asking about, which is the one that's very round in the round, um, we took our direction on that from um, the two rabbis who were there. Um, actually, one who is now, uh, I think, in residence, oh, at the, at the PJCC, uh, Rabbi Lady Darby <coughs> and Rabbi Chai Levy. And um, Rabbi... Levy was most um, articulate in expressing how that congregation was all about relationships between people and relationships of individuals to a, a, divin, a, a divine a divinity of, of, of whatever sort one might elect. And um, it, the, the relationship was the most important thing. That's what got us into the round. It wasn't that we imposed a circle. We didn't say, how would you like a, you know, a curved pew? How would you like a round? <laughs> it was listening to them, hearing that it was, it was making the eye contact, it was being there for the good times, but also being supporting to one another in the bad times, the difficult times, and um, the, uh, the power of that community. That's not what we hear from everybody. Um, others have other uh, primary interests. And so, it's, it's in the listening. I have a mundane question and then maybe we, so, um, because now you said like two times or three times the, the, the beautiful story of the, Nea, of the eternal light that you, whether we can conclude with that. But I have a question to Amy, uh, I guess, or it goes it's more to Amy, which is uh, also a somewhat mundane question. You have a, uh, I mean, a, 
distinction between the commercial and the artistic. I mean, I'm most most of the objects I want to buy or have every single one, <laughs> <laughs> like the sukkah or whatever. <laughs> But you think in terms of you make right uh, objects, ritual objects that are I mean other than the ones that are obviously with the synagogue for purchase <laughs> rather than the museum or how do you think about that? Um, I think uh, I'm not a very good business person. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Judaica for production, I do some things for production. Some things, for example, the Seder plate, and this is probably fairly typical. I originally made one for this exhibit at the Contemporary Jewish Museum, but then a few people were interested, so I decided to make a limited edition, and that was something that was sort of replicable. And the Miriam's Cup was the same way. That was done for Mayan. This uh, feminist group in New York did a Miriam's Cup exhibit at Hebrew Union College. So it was a one-off, and then a few people asked me, so I made a few more. So that's sort of mostly the way I do things, but then I sometimes come up with an idea that I think I can produce in a way that you know, I can make a hundred of. Um, so it's kind of a per on an object by object basis. I know, basis. but last week, as of last week, her Seder plate was available at the CJM in San Francisco. Oh, in the gift shop. Thanks for the <laughs> product placement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a little. Do you want to tell the story? Yeah, yeah it's a little story about the um, Neretimid. Um, the Neretimid is always lit, but sheds no light by which to see. Rather, it scatters light, reflecting the wonder of the eternal a bit differently each second of each minute of each year. Its shards are a reminder of the broken vessels of Isaac Luria's creation myth. It is our task to reassemble them through acts of loving kindness. The uh, performance artist uh, Naomi Newman wrote a wonderful poem about this, and I'll read a little piece of that. With the shattering of the bowls, this is at, at, at the act of creation. With the shattering of the bowls, the divine sparks flew everywhere. Some rushed back to Einsof, some falling, falling, trapped in the broken shards to become our world and us. Though this is hard to believe, the perfect world is all around us, but broken into jagged pieces like a puzzle thrown to the floor the picture lost. Each piece without meaning until someone puts them back together again. We are that someone, there is no one else. We are the ones who can find the broken pieces, remember how they fit together, and rejoin them. Hmm. So one story of the Ne'er Tamid are the broken shards, the shards that were broken at creation because um, the power of creation was just too great and too marvelous, too wondrous to, to be contained. It's our job. Um, the other story is um, the story of the individual shard pieces um, and the prayers uh, to which they refer. This is the, the Hebrew letter Shin, which is an S, which is the first letter of the Shema, which is the central um, prayer, central watchword of faith. And it, reading up, the letters are rising in the words of the prayer. Um, etched into the shards are the letters of the Shema, recalling Rabbi Hanina's amazing vision. Um, he, as he died a martyr's death, uh, this is a story that we retell every Yom Kippur, so some of you may recognize it as a part of the um, Ela Es Kara. Um, as he died a martyr's death, wrapped in the Torah, th this, he was burned at the stake. He was wrapped in a Torah because there was a thought that that would slow the burn and be even more dreadful. Um, and, and, and you also need to know, it's traditional to have the words of the Shema on your lips as you leave this world. So, as he died a martyr's death, wrapped in the Torah, chanting the Shema, he claimed the parchment was burning, but the letters of Torah were flying free, never to be eradicated. So this is, out of the shards, the story of the, um, 
the prayer, the, the, the Hebrew letters that could not be contained and are, exist at all times. Is that a fire yeah. alarm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. The end. The end. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, yeah. <laughs> So that's it. And then we, this was done first, the synagogue in, in Los Angeles, where we, where we um, wrapped and wrapped the chapel in the floating letters, was yet another attempt at getting to that, um, that miracle of the letters being unbound. Thank you. Thanks Thank for your you. questions. Thank you. <laughs>